It all begins in the basement of the house, when the man orders Roland to start the ritual. He knew that if he regularly gave large doses of a magical power stimulant, the chances of success of the transformation experiment would increase. Melissa, the boy's sister, was told to give the bottle to her brother. It's a potion, so it won't taste good. He needs to accept it and drink it. The girl realized that the potion in the pill was a stimulant of magical power, but she did not know when Renka had started giving it to the boy. According to the story, if he continues to take it from that day on, his veins will no longer contain human blood, but a dark blue substance that stimulates magical power. The girl passes the bottle to her brother, and today is the day from the original story. It was hard to believe it, but all the factors pointed to it. The irreparable could soon happen, and Roland was ready to drink what he was given. Karina runs in their direction and knocks the bottle out of her hand. It falls and breaks. The children were scared. They did not understand why she was doing it. The man was irritated by the girl's actions, and he said that if she stopped the experiment in this way again, he would cut off her arm or leg. The man leaves them, saying that the boy is too useless. They are done for the day. All of them were already in the room, and the girl was worried that Karina might be punished because of them, but she was more concerned about their safety. The children said he was fine. Their maid ruffled their hair. The girl got up from her knees. Now they have to rest, and she bows and leaves the room. Before she could leave, the boy pulled her dress, asking her to stay with them a little longer, knowing that she was busy, but not really wanting to disturb her. Karina was surprised. It was the first time Roland had addressed her. He must have been really scared of what had happened, but it couldn't go on. The maid leaves their room with a smile, asking them to wait for her a little longer. She will be back soon. As soon as the door closed, the smile disappeared from her face. Knowing that Renka was giving her a stimulant, she couldn't let this go on. She had to get the children out of here somehow. There is definitely no place for them in this hell. Babies should not suffer at the hands of men anymore. The story involves the girl, the main character Roland and his sister Melissa, who were the children of Mr. Renka's younger sister. After their mother's death, the children were sent to an orphanage, but after a while their uncle decided to take them in. The man did it for a reason. He did it just for the magic that these children have. Roland was the one who had the most power. Unfortunately for him, he was born with an unusual talent. When his uncle got this boy, he became full of ambition and thirst for power over the world. For this purpose, he decided to make Roland an archmage, but Roland resisted this, so the man began to punish Melissa for his mistakes. The punishments were brutal. The poor girl died just a few years later, and the boy was not even allowed to mourn her because he was not going to finish his studies. A few years after everything happened, Roland became stronger than the archmages of his time, so strong that he once saved everyone from a terrible catastrophe. Having gained such power, he wanted revenge and soon brutally murdered Renka. But even after that, he did not stop blaming himself for his sister's death. His life was forever filled with pain. It was a story written in a book that the heroine had read in her past life. And page by page, she delved into the plot and thought of only one thing. She felt sorry for them, the poor children. They certainly didn't deserve this kind of life. If at least someone could take care of them, their fate would not be so terrible. When she was reborn in this story, she had already forgotten most of the plot, but no wonder it was one of the piles of books on her shelf. None of this mattered. She melted when she saw the smiles of these children and heard them calling her. She knew clearly that she was in this world to make them happy, and once she accepted her role, she began to make a plan to escape. Karina quickly ran away. Now we need to get everything ready, so that they can escape at the first opportunity. In her reports about Renka, she overstated the cost of food and accommodation. She was saving money for escape. Edmure is a densely populated city far from Renka's home, an ideal option for them, all set to escape. The girl walked with a bag of money in her hands and thought it over. Her uncle usually sleeps from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., which meant they only had three hours. She spent two hours getting ready. There was only one left. They need to leave the estate. Time is short, but they will manage. No one must know about it. If they are caught, they will be in great danger. Karina went to the door of the room, knocked on it, and asked the children if she could enter the room. They were frightened by her arrival, and the boy asked if they didn't have any extra training now so they could quickly get dressed so that their uncle wouldn't get angry. The maid was smiling, so they didn't have to worry because they didn't go to him. Melissa was excited thinking that the girl had come to play with them for a while. Roland didn't understand what was happening. He couldn't believe that they could really just play with her now. The girl felt sad from what she heard, because they are just children who lack love and care. Karina finally tells us the reason for her coming. She knows a good place, 
and suggests that they all run away from here together, right now. She tells the children that Renko wants to repeat the experiment to change the human mind with magic, so she wants to leave the room early. The maid abruptly asks them if they had accidentally made a homunculus. She would not scold them for it. It would be useful when they escaped from here. The children can only get out of here with their uncle, so they will use a homunculus to get around this. A man made by magic, this creature will help them escape. If the magician does not concentrate during the formation, everything can go badly, even death. So the creation of a homunculus is forbidden. These children have already created one once, and everything was fine. The girl tells Melissa and Roland that if they make a homunculus like their uncle, they will be able to escape. The boy is actually afraid to use magic, but he is ready to do anything to help the girl. Melissa says that if the maid is confident that the plan will work, they will try, but no, they will definitely manage. My brother was a little nervous, but he hugged his sister. He wasn't afraid if they did it together. She encouraged him. Everything should be fine. They had done it last time. Karina said that now they were going to make a homunculus, and then she would speak instead of Renka. The girl has prepared everything she needs for the ritual, and there is little time left, so she has to start. The children began to conjure, the homunculus began to appear, and they were very focused on their work. They coped with this task. He looked exactly like Renka. Few people would have noticed the difference. The girl was smiling and hugging her brother. They did it the first time. The boy said she was good. They both did a good job. Karina was happy. Everything was going according to plan. Now she had to get out of here as soon as possible. Renka was sleeping. Now was the best time to escape. They have already left the room, and the butler has met them in the corridor. Everything should be fine. He won't notice anything if the heroine does her job. The man tried to talk to the gentleman, asking him to tell him where he was going, and then he would tell him to get a carriage. Karina stepped in front of her uncle, explaining that the Lord was unable to speak now due to the side effects of one of his recent spells, and they were going to gather herbs in the forest. This time, she spoke angrily to the butler on purpose. He doesn't want them to stay here forever. Side effects are not something to joke about, and he may get worse over time. The servant was confused, and could only say that he understood everything, that the carriage would be waiting for them in the backyard of the estate. They did it. The butler doesn't suspect anything, but they can't let their guard down as long as they're in the city. The danger is not going away. Karina opens the carriage. They have already arrived. It will be a little difficult from here. They will have to walk. The children wanted to continue riding in the carriage, so she got them out and promised that as soon as they arrived, they would find the fastest carriage and it would take them to the city in no time. Melissa and Roland were scared. The homunculus was running out of time. It was disappearing, so they had to hurry. Renka had an hour to sleep when they escaped, but now he was probably awake. Karina was holding the kids' hands as they walked through the city, with life bustling around them, laughing and playing. The girl approached the man to ask where she could find a crew to Edmure, one that was leaving right now, but the man yawned and said that there were none today. She was just about to ask when the nearest crew would be when she was interrupted by Melissa, who told her to look away right now. The heroine glanced to the side, and there stood one of Renka's henchmen, who must have already noticed their tardiness and sent a servant to fetch them. We need to run now, she asks where this crew is going. It was suitable for them, although they are going to Torres, not Edmure. The girl asked to be allowed to join this crew. They really needed it. She didn't mind, even when she heard that there were no seats, and they would have to travel in the baggage department. She was very grateful when they were allowed to join this carriage, she called the children, and they went to the carriage to get inside. They were already sitting together in the carriage. The girl said that they would soon leave the city so they could catch their breath, and the children were happy about it. Uncle Renka would no longer force them to do magic, and he would not catch them either. Karina said that everything was over. It's over. The children can live a happy life, not like in the story. She wondered if they were going to Torres. She had seen the name in the original book, but couldn't remember much. They started shaking abruptly. Someone outside shouted that they had left the city, and at the same moment she remembered everything about Torres. There is a man who can interfere with Roland's new life. This is Duke Claude Torres, known for recruiting talented people on the principle that the end justifies the means, and because of this addiction, he is nicknamed the Talent Fan. The Archimagus Roland was one of those whom the Duke wanted to recruit, but he refused all offers, and after a bunch of refusals, Claude had a grudge against Roland. From then on, wherever Roland was, the Duke would appear, imposing a battle on him and leaving him in ruins. If the Duke notices the kid's talent, he won't have a happy life. 
The girl recalled that back then, people did not even approach the boy because they did not want to have a conflict with the Duke. And that is why Roland's life was spent alone, not what he dreamed of. They had finally arrived, and the children were happy. They asked the girl to look in different directions. There was so much to see. The girl laughed. They were full of energy even after the long journey. She was happy. That they had gotten to Torres without any problems, but that they would spend more money than they had planned. They really didn't have much money left, only one hundred kivrin, and if they went to Edmer, they would have to live on the streets. In history, the first meeting between the Duke and Roland will take place much later that day, and the Duke is already interested in the Archmage, and he has no use for an eight-year-old boy. Now she needs to find a job and save up money to go to Edmure. So far, there are no other options. Karina sat down to talk to the children. She said that they needed to stay here for now. They didn't have enough money to go to Edmure. The heroine smiled and said she wanted to stay here to earn some money. She had a good idea. Melissa and Roland were also smiling, and they agreed to stay here. The man in the hotel said that a night there cost ten kivrin, although the door says five, but there are three of them, so he will take it as if it were two, because they are still children. He asked her who she was related to those two. He could not accommodate them if she did not answer. At that time, the children were already very sleepy. To avoid suspicion, she didn't say anything to Roland and Melisops, slash, slash, IMG2. Mixlib pot me manga namjuleolib, young habnida webtoon slash chapters, slash 213648, 1 slash 0, 306 underscore LCAD, PNG, so she said she was their mother. The man didn't really believe it, but apparently they just got better at their father's place. He put them up. They could take the room at the end of the corridor. She sat down next to the children and apologized for pretending to be their mother without warning. Otherwise, she would have been suspected of kidnapping them. They will be asked this question many more times in the near future, and she asked if it was okay if she pretended to be their mother for the time being. Melissa and Roland were smiling. They always wanted her to be their mom. It would be cool if they were her children. Karina realized that they loved her, but she had no idea that they loved her so much. They asked her if they could call her mom, and of course she said yes and the children immediately started hugging her and called her mom for the first time. In the morning, the protagonist wanted to go and look for a job, and she told Melissa about it because she was already awake. She asked them not to open the door to anyone. She heard a lot of excuses. One man told her that with two children, she wouldn't need a break if they got sick or something like that. At another place, an elderly woman also refused her. She was afraid that she would need to be away very often because of her children. Someone even said that they don't hire single moms, and there have been many attempts and all failed. Karina was already too exhausted. She had been to ten places, she had been rejected everywhere, and there was only one last attempt left. It was a jewelry store, and the man immediately asked me the difference between a ruby and a garnet. He only takes people who know about gemstones. The girl asked to be given a chance. She was a very fast learner, but the worker said he didn't have time for that. He needed someone who could start working right away. He was busy, so he asked her to leave. The heroine was already hopeless, and that was enough for her for today. She turned around, and behind her she saw a shining stone. It looked very simple, but she couldn't take her eyes off it. She reached out to it. The man started shouting loudly, telling her to move away, that she shouldn't touch those stones. She touched the stone anyway. Everything around her shone. She fell and twisted. She was very hot. Her whole body felt like it was on fire. A man came up to her, took her to his side, took the girl's hands in his, and a blue light appeared. Finally, she was able to wake up. Now she was very cold, as if she had been doused with ice water, and she saw a man standing next to her, asking if she was okay. Karina was frightened. She did not know who this man was, or what she was doing in his arms, and she sharply pushed him away. A store employee approached the man, asking if he was okay. Claude asked the girl why she pushed him away. He was saving her. It was rude. She apologized for what she had done, but she still didn't understand what was going on here. This stone must have been used to blow something up. The man shook himself off and continued to say that if he hadn't intervened, she would have been dead. Her body would have been completely destroyed by the explosion. The explosion would not only have killed her, but the entire store would have exploded. The man cursed at Wilder for leaving such a dangerous stone unattended. The seller made excuses, saying that he had asked the lady to leave the store earlier and she hadn't done so, and then reached for the stones. Karina fell into a stupor. She didn't hear that this man had just been addressed as Your Highness. He turned to the heroine. The man forgot to introduce himself. He was Duke Torres. Claude asked her name, but she didn't answer. 
This meeting changed Karina's life forever. Finally, she was able to introduce herself. She is Karina Bluth. The man had never heard her name before, but she had only recently arrived here, and he wondered what the Duke was doing in a simple jeweler's shop. According to the story, after Roland became an adult, Duke Torres became the cause of all his troubles. Commoners avoided him because of his constant conflicts with the Duke. The nobility saw him only as an archimage whom they wanted to recruit. Torres's recognition of his talent only fueled public interest in him. Even the highest mages fought each other to get such a valuable ally. All of this hindered Roland, prevented him from starting the life he had always dreamed of. He wanted the simplest life, to be with those he loved. If the two ever come into contact, it will happen again. So she should stay away. She has to leave now. She bows to the man, thanks him for saving her, but it's time to go. Herzog stopped her. He accidentally overheard her talking to Wildbur, and he asks if she needs a job. She needed a job, but the owner of the jewelry store said he needed someone who knew about stones, and she apologized again because she had to leave. An elderly man stopped her, and she told him that she was looking for a job because she had two children. He had an offer that paid enough, and she could provide for them and herself. Claude thought about it. The children had been mentioned earlier, but he couldn't believe it was true either. Her husband offered as much as 900 Kirvan every month, and she would not find a job in this place that offered more than that. The girl thought about it. It was a really good offer. 900 is a lot and enough to provide for three people. But if the Duke is in this shop, then the chances of him and Roland meeting are high, so it would be better to look for another place, even if it takes longer. Karina thanked him for the offer, but she had to decline. She didn't think she was right for the job. She said goodbye and was ready to leave. The man tries to stop her again but it was too late. She had left. The children thanked Karina for the food. Melissa said it was strange. She ate quite a lot, but her stomach was still rumbling. It was time to brush her teeth, and she was getting her brother up to go with her, but he hadn't even finished his breakfast yet. The girl was sitting upset. Melissa knew that they didn't have much money, and she didn't want to burden her by hiding the fact that she wasn't hungry. At this rate, they would soon starve. She recalled the offer from the jewelry store, which would have been enough money to eat well for a month and save up for a move to the capital, but the children needed to be kept away from there. Karina came up to the kids and said that she had forgotten to buy groceries yesterday, so now she had to leave for a while. They would be alone. Melissa and Roland smiled at her. They didn't mind her leaving. They were used to it. They just asked her to bring something tasty. The girl was going to a jewelry store. Nothing will happen if she works for the old man for a while. Just be careful. She opens the door, and besides Wild Burr, the Duke is there. It was an unexpected meeting. She didn't think he would be here, and she thanked him again for saving her yesterday. She was a little embarrassed, as if he didn't have other things to do. Claude did not look her in the eye. He said that it was enough to thank him. Once was definitely enough, he asked her what the reason for her visit was today. Karina asked whether her husband's offer was still valid, and she received a positive answer. She was also interested in whether they would really pay 900 kivrins, and the man even offered to sign a contract. But the girl had two requests. The first was to explain what happened yesterday, and if the stone she touched was charged with magic, if there was a chance. She would not work if it happened again. If she is injured or dies, there will be no one to take care of her children, so yesterday's incident is very disturbing to her. She wants to know what happened and why it happened. Herzog said that it was not her fault, only Wildbur's fault, and that there was no need to throw any dangerous objects around. The man said that the Duke was right. He had acted rashly by leaving the stone in an easily accessible place. He just didn't expect a person to be around to activate it. She asked why he reacted to her in this way. In response, she heard that one possible explanation was that she had magical potential. She was close enough to trigger the explosion yesterday that it only happens in three cases. The first was a way in which a beginner uses a strong spell that he doesn't have the strength to cast, and then loses control. The second way is when a magician ignores the restrictions associated with magic, which entails such consequences. The third way is when a magician fails to tame a stone that has gotten out of control. This is the one about her. It seems that the stone could not withstand the long exposure to her energy. Karina says that she didn't use magic yesterday, and she's never used magic at all. It was expected. She wasn't born with magic. She had to train and awaken it constantly. The Duke said that few people are born with such a talent. It's rare. There is no one with such magic in their place. The owner says that this is why he left the stone in a prominent place. But if she works here, everything will change. He promises to be as careful as possible. 
What happened yesterday will not happen again. The girl voiced her second condition. If she said she wanted to quit her job, they would let her go without asking any questions. Wildbur begins to say that if she doesn't take her things and leave as expected, then... But he couldn't finish. The Duke rises from his seat, says that everything is fine, and they sign a contract. Wilbur will treat her so well that there will be no thoughts of dismissal. She agreed with everything, accepted their offer, and asked where she should start. First, she needed to see something, so Claude asked the man to get it. They bought 15 crystals with an imbalance. They don't know how to evaluate them. It can take forever. The girl recalled that Renka used a lot of stones, almost all kinds, but this was the first time she had heard of them. Karina was invited to come up to the table to look at the stones, and that's what she will do. She was asked if she could see anything. Wildbur, thinking that she was talking to him, said that of course not, they were all the same. Claude was not very pleased, saying that he had not asked him, but Karina, and that perhaps Madame Bluth had noticed something. She picks up one of the crystals, it shines, and she says that it is the only one that is magical. The Duke smiled. She had done the task well and quite quickly. He knew she definitely had something in her. Torres took the stone and left the shop. He didn't listen to what the man was saying. He thought they could manage without him. In any case, Wildbur has to trust the Duke, who has a keen eye, and since the employee he approved turned out to be so gifted, he shakes hands with Madame Bluth. It's been a Sunday since she's been working there. It's nothing hard. She's doing odd jobs and studying the stones a little bit. But Wildbur still hasn't said anything about the magic stones. Everything is quite calm, but they seem to be close with the Duke. She didn't notice how she accidentally mentioned the Duke's name, and the man asked why she spoke up for him so abruptly, if there was something to do. And she started to make excuses that he hadn't been in for a long time. Wildbur said that the Duke is probably preoccupied with crystals with a disturbed balance. He has been interested in them since he was very young. He loses track of time when he sits down to study them. He asked her to put down the broom, to look at the new stones, and he wanted to hear her opinion about them. The man was smiling. He was praising the girl, and she could tell at a glance which stone was magical. She definitely had a gift. The owner of the shop asked us to remember his word, and in three years she would be able to open her own shop, which would be much bigger than this one. Karina asked if she would sell magic stones, but the man said no. She would sell magic. It was a profitable business. The only drawback was that she had to deal with dark magicians. The girl dared to ask if Duke Torres was a magician, and the man was about to tell her everything, but someone entered the shop. The heroine returned, and as usual, she greeted the guest who came to them. Claude visited them, and he greeted Madame Bluth in return. Wildbur said that he had arrived quite on time. They had just spoken for him, and the Duke asked him again. He was curious about what the two were talking about. The girl said that they had just started talking about magic crystals, and when the man heard this, he handed her a bag of stones from the imperial family. The Duke started to speak about his headache, and the shopkeeper asked why he had a headache since he was the only one who was really suffering here, but he quickly turned it into a joke. Madame Bluth was asked to look at the stones in the bag, and her expression immediately changed. She felt that something was dangerous. It was similar to the stone she had seen on her first visit here. Claude angrily snatched the bag from the girl. He was furious that they dared to give him such a crystal. Wildbur told Karina to take a closer look. This is the side of the personality that interested her, but no matter how you look at it, he doesn't look like a magician, Maybe he uses crystals differently. The Duke began to do something incomprehensible. Everything began to shine. In his hands, something began to appear. The room began to fill with smoke. The girl did not understand what was happening. She could not see anything at all. In a flash, a sword appeared in the man's hands, and pure white light emanated from it. Claude said that this time it worked, and Wildbur was curious about what he was talking about, so he asked him again. He reminded him of the crystal that had reacted to Madame Bluth, and he hadn't been able to turn it into a sword until now. The shop owner said that he had asked him to be careful, that if something happened, he would be responsible for it. The Duke was a little indignant, because the man was lecturing him too often. Claude wondered what it was, but she immediately realized that this crystal was magical, and that Madame Bluth was probably more talented than he had thought. My husband thanked her. She helped him a lot. He almost let the crystal he received from the imperial family explode. He wants to thank her somehow. Karina said there was no need. She just wants to understand what just happened. An explanation would really be enough for her. The girl thought that if he insisted on giving her a reward, she would definitely not refuse. First, the man decides to tell her that he is a magical knight. After that, Wildbur speaks, saying that the girl doesn't understand what he's saying, 
and why he poses with a sword. The duke was a little nervous, and he wanted to explain this. What distinguishes them from ordinary knights is the ability to turn magic stones into swords. That is, knights who are not mages can use magic swords because of their skills. Karina asks if she understood correctly that he was turning stones into a sword, that this particular sword was created by concentrating energy, and it was true, but she felt a dangerous energy coming from him. The duke did not understand the reason for this, and he asked Wilbur to hide it away. The man began to approach the woman. She tried to move away a little bit. He had met many talented people, but he had never seen anyone like her. His late parents would never forgive him if he missed this chance. Claude takes the girl's hands in his and asks her if she will accept his offer to serve the house of Torres. Karina was embarrassed, wondering if he really wanted her to become his servant, and why he stood up as if he were proposing to her. To become his servant, one must at least be the daughter of a knight, why he was offering this without knowing her background. He asks her if she is interested in his offer, and she begins to worry how a commoner like her can serve him. The duke understood what was bothering her. He said that more than half of his servants were not of noble birth. Most people from Torres had moved to the capital, and this place was just a break from their routine. Take Wildbur, for example. He's not even a knight, but he became a subject of House Torres. He helped his parents for many years and has known him since childhood. What will she say now? There is no reason to reject his proposals. Karina began to say that she had children to take care of. Claude says that if she starts working for them, it will be better for the children. He will pay much more than she earns now. If she accepts, she will have a lot of responsibilities, which means she will spend less time with Roland and Melissa, and that's not the way it should be. The girl bows. She thanks him for the offer, but has to refuse, and the man asks her to tell him why. The reason is simple. She can't promise him fidelity. She can't spend time at work that she should be spending with her children. The duke smiled. He was glad that this was her only reason for refusing, but he goes on to say that he thinks she just doesn't want to see him. Karina began to say that it was not like he could have thought of such a thing. He must have seen how nervous she was around him. The man started laughing. He told her he was just joking and asked her how her children were doing, if they were settling in well. The girl was embarrassed. His smile. He was beautiful when he smiled. In the moment, she did not understand what was happening or how such thoughts could have come to her mind. Wildbear says that Madame has lived far from big cities for a long time, and she knows little about how everything is organized in Torres. Claude said that it was strange that even if you live in a village, don't you have to send your children to school, even though in many regions it is not mandatory. The shopkeeper turns to Madame Bluth, who tells him that there is an institution in Torres called a school for children whose families cannot afford private tutors. The girl wondered if the school system there was the same as in her previous life, so she decided to ask what they taught the children. The duke told her that they teach arithmetic and writing, and she was surprised that that was all. But the man asked her why she thought that was not enough, that beauty didn't need more. She wondered why there were no complicated calculations and formulas. They had gone through a lot of that in her past life. Wild Burr laughed. Parents would be unhappy if school taught unnecessary things. That is, they are useless if they do not help them earn a living. Karina ran home. She was completely in her own mind. If the children go to school, they will be able to make friends among their peers, which is not bad. But how they will react to this news, we need to ask. She was carrying cookies in her hands, the first time she had bought them since she had been here, so they could eat them together and talk about school and everything. The girl comes into the room. She just wanted to ask how their day was, but she sees a terrible mess in the room. She didn't see the children there. She was scared and started running around the room calling for her children, but they were not there, the person who broke in and took the children to his place. The heroine fell to her knees and started crying. She shouldn't have left them alone. She couldn't protect them. Renka took them away for sure. She heard a scream from the bathroom. Someone was calling for her mother. It was definitely Roland's voice, and she quickly got up and ran there. The girl opens the door abruptly, and Melissa and Roland are standing there, a little scared, and they tell me that they tried to clean the floor from the flour they spilled. She fell to her knees, and it was good that the children were okay. The mess was because of the flour dough. Renka didn't take the children away. The kids apologized to their mother again, saying they didn't mean to dirty the bathroom and the room. It was their fault, and they were sorry for what they had done. Karina wiped tears from her eyes. She would not scold them and would not punish them either. She just asked them to explain what had happened. They said that they just wanted to make delicious bread, so they decided to use magic, but something went wrong because their uncle had never taught them how to create bread with magic. The girl hugged them tightly. 
She could see that they were very scared. Renka had only taught them destruction magic. No wonder they didn't know how to use magic to cook. She was worried that the children would find magic unpleasant. And after everything that had happened to them, she didn't know whether to be relieved that it wasn't. Karina asked Melissa what she was hiding behind her back. There was a bedspread. It was very dirty, but it was not a problem. She would wash it while they were washing. The cleaning was in full swing, and the heroine was reminded of the days when she cleaned Renka's laboratory, and it was difficult to wash the insides of those creatures stuck to the wall. Just thinking about that time gave her goosebumps. The children had already washed themselves and came out of the bathroom happy, but the girl brought them back, saying they needed to wash their hair better if they didn't want the dough to harden on their heads. The cleaning was over. She decided to sit down to rest. She hadn't been so tired in a long time, and Roland came over, crying, and asked if it was because of them that she was tired. At the same time, Melissa came up. She was also crying. They just wanted to help her, but they didn't give her any help. They thought they didn't need her anymore. Karina was confused by what she heard, and she asked them what they had just said, how they could say such things. Roland and Melissa continued to cry. They don't want to see her exhausted anymore. They want her to smile and be happy every day. The heroine laughed. They shouldn't worry. She smiles every day just for them, and she is very strong because she has survived Renka's training. Her uncle didn't teach her magic. He knew she had the talent, but he was against her using it, which made her more interested in it and learn more about magic. She told the kids that she had received serious training in this aspect, and thanks to that, she quickly cleaned up the mess. Roland said he didn't want to see his mom suffer, and they would try to avoid trouble next time. Karina wasn't angry. She said that he only did some things wrong. The fact was that they tried to do everything themselves. If there is something that they find difficult to cope with, they can always ask her for help. Nothing will be difficult for her as long as she has them. She hugged Roland. The guy was crying, and the heroine told him that from now on, they could ask her for help. Before going to bed, she combed the kids' hair, and it was time to ask them if they wanted to go to school. They were surprised and turned to her. They didn't know what a school is, so they asked her everything about it and what they would do there. Karina told us that they would teach math and spelling, and the children asked if there would be no magic. They had never learned anything but magic before. The heroine says that they will not learn magic there, but instead will have the opportunity to meet many new friends. This news made the children shine. They liked that they would find new friends there, and they wanted to go to school. A few days later, the girl is waiting for her children. It's their first day at school, and she was worried that they might be bullied or not liked there. Finally, the kids came out. Happy Melissa ran up to her. She had a lot of fun at school today, and the teacher said she read well. Her mom was proud of her. Roland said that his day had gone well, but it was clear that he was not as happy as Melissa. He was much sadder. The girl sat down in front of the boy. She asked him what happened at school, but he said that everything was fine. She could see that he didn't want to talk about it now, that they would have to talk about it later. Karina hugged him and told him that she was glad to hear that, and that if he wanted to talk about anything, he should feel free to tell her any time. The guy was definitely upset about something. It's evening. The girl has made delicious tea for the boy, and they have to keep their voices down a bit now so as not to wake Melissa. The heroine asks Roland if he has made many friends, and he says no. He doesn't need friends. He only needs Melissa. In fact, if you think about it, Roland and Melissa were never separated. The only time they were separated was when the boy failed to read a spell, and his sister was punished for it. Now he's only spent a few hours without her. It's no wonder he's worried and uncomfortable, but they have to be in different classes at school. She asked him if he was sometimes frustrated because he didn't want to play with other children. He replied that he thought he could be with Melissa, but they said it was not possible. Roland says that his teacher told him to attend a different class because he reads and writes better than his sister. If he had known this was going to happen, he would have pretended to do worse. Karina says that he must be disappointed because he can't be with his sister, but he just says that he has to protect her. I wondered why he would defend his sister, if he thought so because Renka was not the one who used violence against her. The guy said he was going to stay by her side until she grew up and became strong, and when asked if it was because of Renka, he shook his head. The girl is in a desperate situation. She cannot let this go on forever. A new idea popped into her head, and she immediately voiced it, suggesting that the boy help Melissa become stronger. Karina said that he could teach her magic, and if he was worried about her accepting it, they could offer it to her together. She's sleeping now, so they'll ask her in the morning, and it's time for the guy to go to bed for now. Melissa heard the whole conversation, and she abruptly got out of bed and asked if it was true that she could learn magic too. 
It was a surprise to Karina and Roland that she was awake. The girl immediately started asking questions. She thought it was cool, and if Roland was her teacher, it would be even better. She wondered what he would teach her first. Wild Burr was giving her salary to Lady Bluth. He gave her a little extra money, because she had moved and it would certainly be useful. She was very grateful. Her husband said that sales have increased a lot since she came here, but she shouldn't get her hopes up. The Duke came up behind her, telling her that Wild Burr was not as generous as she might think, so she shouldn't get her hopes up. The man began to say that not all bosses get a bonus from their first salary. Karina laughed. The old man was right, but she would remember Claude's advice. Even if the bonus is one Kerbin, she will be happy. The man told her that she had to go. Her children were waiting for her at home. They were probably grieving. She bowed and ran away. Duke Torres smiled and gave her a look. The heroine was walking home. She had received her first paycheck, and if she earns this much every month, it won't take long to move to the capital. She happily opens the door and says that she is home, but the children did not meet her happily. She saw Melissa crying, saying that Roland was sick. Karina immediately ran to the guy. He looked terrible. She tried to ask him what happened and how he felt. He had a high fever. Melissa told her mom that she thought he was in a lot of pain, and they had to do something right away. The girl ran out of the house, and it was good that she remembered where the hospital was. In the original story, Roland was never sick, so it's not clear why it happened now. Perhaps it's because she changed the future that he got sick, but she can't jump to conclusions. It's important that he gets treatment now. The doctor said that he usually does not visit patients' homes at this time, but he made an exception for her, so she would have to pay twice as much. The man waved. He could not say his diagnosis. Only God knows his future. The girl did not understand what he meant, so she asked what was wrong with him. He wasn't too sure, but it might be Peter's, because more than 50% of people who contract it die. Even if they are cured, they suffer from the side effects of the disease. The man said that there were no people in Torres who could cure him. Melissa began to cry bitterly, asking Roland not to die. Because the children were listening, the man could not go into details. He asked for the entire payment of 300 Kirvin, although he did not think she had that kind of money. After the girl handed over the entire amount, he smiled. He didn't think she would pay the entire fee right away. He left them. At that time, Roland woke up and asked his mom if he was dying. She said no. He would definitely get better and become a great man, because his mother knows everything. Melissa brought some water, as the boy had to take the medicine they had given him. Karina thanked her and told her not to worry yet, because he would definitely get better. My mother said that Roland would definitely not die. The girl kept crying. The doctor who came to see them was a liar because he said that her brother would die. Karina said that she was right. She would find a new doctor tomorrow, and the boy needed to get ready, take his medication, and go back to bed. The boy was given medicine, which he drank, and the heroine had to leave. She went to bring him a cold towel, but he stopped her and said he was going to a shelter. The girl came back and asked what he was talking about. Renko was not here, but he was still fighting for them. She hugs him. They barely managed to escape from his estate, and he thinks he is a failure to them. The girl said that this was not true. Without the two of them, she would never have been able to escape. The heroine left there for their own good, and now Karina is happier than ever, and it's all thanks to the two of them. Mrs. Bluth told Roland not to say that he wanted to go back to the orphanage for her sake, that he should sleep now, and when he did, he would feel better. No matter how terrible things are, she will not send them to the orphanage. She remembers well what that place is. What the directors do to children is shocking. They gather orphans who have nowhere to go in order to force them to work for free. Even when they were sick, they were just left alone in the orphanage. Roland knows what it's like. Doesn't he believe she won't leave them? Now he will have to work hard to earn their trust. A new doctor has given him a new diagnosis. It's Alco, and the mortality rate is 80%. But he's lucky. It's not a contagious disease, so they can stay with him until he closes his eyes. The girl was shocked. He could die. But he called him lucky. How could the doctor say that without blinking an eye? The man said that there was no cure for the disease. You just need to pray to God. He then immediately asked for payment and started counting the money. Is Roland really going to die? Everyone says different things. Some say it's Peter. Some say it's Akko. Is his condition so bad that they can't understand what he's sick with? In the original, Roland did not suffer from a fatal illness as a child. And if the protagonist had a similar near-death experience, she would have remembered it. It happened because she changed the future. It was her mistake. 
A woman enters the room and asks if it's Karina by any chance. She introduces herself, calls herself Dr. Verity Solvaton, and says she was sent by Mr. Deviasen. The heroine could not remember this name. She did not understand who this man was. She didn't know who sent the doctor or whether she should let him examine Roland, even though the name Deviasen sounded familiar. Verity had already checked the guy, asked if he had any other symptoms despite the fever, and asked him to tell her how many doctors had come and what diagnoses they had made. Karina said that there were three of them, including the one who came in for a short time. One said it was Peter's, the other said it was Alco's, and the third said it was an unknown incurable disease. The woman doctor was already screaming. These people did not deserve to call themselves doctors because it was just food poisoning. The heroine could not believe that food poisoning was curable, so why did they tell her to pray to God? Verity said that the symptoms were serious, but it was simple poisoning. There is no cure for it, and doctors know this, so people don't want to pay them, so they start cheating. The girl fell to her knees, everything said, and that was the reason why they told her to pray to God. The doctor helped her up, and Karina wanted to pay her, but she refused, saying she shouldn't pay her, and that she should only give Roland porridge and water for now, and to contact her if his symptoms get worse. The woman was leaving the room, but Karina ran to her and asked her to stop. She decided to ask who Mr. Deviasen was. She would like to thank him for his help. Verity said that she probably already knew him. He wouldn't want her to say more than she needed to. Karina was trying to figure out who it was when Melissa came over and asked if Roland was going to be okay. Of course, he will be fine. He will get better soon, so there is no need to worry about him. The girl cried. She was scared. But everything would be fine, the heroine swore to her. She saw the name Deviasen in the story, but it was upsetting that she did not remember the story completely. Memories came back to me. Renka was talking to Roland, asking him if he really believed that he was his uncle, that he had inherited the blood of the Renka house, that he and his sister were nothing to him. The guy was screaming. He didn't understand why it was like that, why it had to be him and Melissa. They were the only ones in the orphanage who had mana, and the director immediately sold them for a few pennies. He even offered to pretend to be their relative, and the man laughed. Roland was angry. He lied to him. The only reason he didn't kill him was because he thought he was their mother's brother. But it was all a lie. When he found out the truth, he fell into despair. It overwhelmed him to such an extent. He couldn't control his own mana. He had already become an archmage and had enough power to destroy all life. After that day, he was no longer called the archmage. People nicknamed him the killer who killed thousands. Karina was frightened. It had happened again. She had seen one part of the original story that she could not remember. It was an event that had tormented Roland all his life. And this time, he would make these children happy, no matter what. Wildbur said that the girl looked quite happy, and she was. Her son was feeling better, and she was sorry that she couldn't work for a few days. The man said that it was normal to take time off when her child was sick. She even came here that morning to tell him in person. The heroine promised that she would be very diligent today until closing time. Her uncle got angry and said that she should work overtime to make up for the days she missed. The girl didn't understand what he meant, so she asked him again. He was just joking. He laughed out loud. Karina thanked him for sending Dr. Sylvain to her. The man did not understand what she meant. He asked who he had sent. Wasn't it him who sent Dr. Sylvain? But it wasn't. He said he wasn't sure she would have done what he asked her to do. Madame Bluth said that she was sent by someone she knows very well, but she knows no one else in Torres, she named Mr. Deviasen. The man was surprised. He asked her if she was sure about what she had just said, and she told him that it was one of their clients. And when he came, he was surprised that she was not at work, so he told him the reason. The girl was pleased. He was one of their clients, so she knew his name. She asked if he knew where he lived. She would visit him and personally express her gratitude. Wildbur will make sure to tell Mr. Deviasen what she just said. He will be pleased. Karina helped the children get dressed. They wanted to make a good first impression on Mr. Deviasen. Melissa asked what he liked, but her mother didn't know. She had never met him before, but she was sure he was very kind. He thought that it would be too hard for them to travel to his house, so he decided to come to visit them himself. Roland said that when he met him, he would thank him for his help. It was wonderful, and Karina is sure that her husband will be happy to see the little one healthy and full of energy. There was a knock at the door, and the girl ran to meet the guest. When she opened the door, Duke Torres stood in front of her. He said he knew it might not be polite, but he wanted to come here at least once. It would have been impolite to leave him standing at the door, so she invited him to come into the room. She was afraid that it might be modest for him, 
but she suggested that he sit down at the table. The girl couldn't believe it. He couldn't be Mr. Deviasen. And what would happen if he immediately noticed that Roland had the talent to become an archmage? The children sat down together at the table with the duke. They were pleased to meet him. They told him their names, Roland and Melissa. Karina was a little embarrassed. She started to say that it was not Mr. Deviasen, but the man interrupted her. Hazog said that his full name is Claude Deviasen Torres. Torres is more like a title. He usually performs under the name Claude Deviasen. He called the doctor anyway. He thought she would refuse if she knew it was from him. He has no disrespect for her. The heroine began to say that everything was fine. There was no reason to worry. She had to say that. That everything was fine. Even if it wasn't, she couldn't demand an explanation for why he lied to her. She says that this is the second time she has been indebted to him. The first time was when he saved her life, and this time he saved her son. She is sincerely grateful to him. Melissa also expressed her gratitude to Mr. Deviason, and her mother told her that Roland had gotten better because of his help. Karina told the girl that she could not call her husband that. The Duke said that it was okay. She was just a child. All he did was call a doctor. They shouldn't thank him. In addition, he heard about other doctors. Those who made the wrong diagnosis would be punished. How could they deceive sick people? It was evil. Mrs. Bluth was glad to hear this. She hoped there would be no more victims like her. He seems to work very hard to take care of his property. The man laughed. He thanked her for saying such nice things to him. Roland could not take his eyes off their guest. Claude noticed that the guy was really very charming. The girl was cleaning up after the guest's visit. It was all so strange. Why would the Duke come here alone on a street full of miserable houses like this one? Why would he want to sit at the same table with commoners? She said out loud that it was definitely very strange. At that time, Roland came over and asked what was strange, and she said that the Duke was very kind to them. The boy thought that this was not a bad thing. It was true, but it is not uncommon for high-ranking nobles like Duke Torres to be completely unconcerned with the commoners. If she realized that Roland had the potential to become an archmage, it would be stupid for her to think that everything would be fine just because Roland was still young. What will happen if the Duke finds out about Roland's talent? She can't let that happen. Melissa runs up to them and says that Mr. Deviasen's good attitude toward them may be because he likes Karina. The heroine was embarrassed. She didn't understand what Melissa was saying because it was definitely not like that. Roland told the girl that the Duke kept looking at her mother and smiling. The little girl was sure that the man liked her. Karina laughed. It was definitely not possible. Her daughter began to say that every time she turned away, the man continued to feed on her. When her mother said she shouldn't tease an adult, the girl said she wasn't doing it, and the man really didn't take his eyes off her. Then Roland joined in, and it seemed that the Duke kept looking at her because he liked her. He swore that when she turned her head, he always smiled at her. Karina said that he simply could not say such things, but the boy did not understand why. The reason was that the Duke was a high-ranking nobleman, and if someone heard what they were talking about, they could report him to the police. The children did not understand. They started asking if she wanted to report Roland and Melissa to the police. The heroine laughed. Of course, it wasn't like anyone could claim such wonderful children as they were, and the Duke would marry a beautiful lady who looked like a princess. Melissa climbed into her mother's arms and said that she also looked like a beautiful princess. Karina thanked her, but the two of them are much more beautiful than her. The girl said she liked Mr. Deviasen. He was like a prince. It would be nice if he could visit them every day. Roland said no. He didn't like him. The boy asked his mother what would happen if he wanted to marry her. Karina crouched down to be on equal footing with the boy and asked him what made him think that. He shared his thoughts, saying that the Duke liked her, so he might marry her. My mom hugged him tightly and said that this would never happen. It was strange that children think about such things, but it was cute. The boy said that she was beautiful, so he knows that there is nothing to be done about the fact that people like her, but he still wants to live with just the three of them. The heroine replied that she also liked living together, so he shouldn't worry. They would continue to live like that. The children were ready to go to bed, so the girl could get ready as well. She looked in the mirror and was horrified. She did not understand what was wrong with her hair. That's why the Duke was smiling at her. She was dressed neatly, but her hair was a mess. Karina approached the children. She asked why they didn't tell her about the hair, but they didn't understand what was wrong. They looked like they were messed up, but they said it wasn't at all. Her hair was beautiful. Indeed, there is no way that the Duke would be interested in her. She is no more than a pebble in the street for a man like him. The children had already fallen asleep, 
and the girl had been afraid that Duke Torres and Roland would run into each other since they arrived here, and she couldn't believe that they had met like this. The Duke didn't react when he saw Roland, unless he was trying to recruit him in the original story, which is fine until Roland became an archmage. Besides, the Duke doesn't even know that Roland can use magic, so maybe she has nothing to worry about. Karina tells Wilbur that he should have told her who Mr. Deviusen was, and if he had, she would have been better prepared. The man says that she is lying, that if she knew, she would refuse to meet him, and that if she did know, it would not change her gratitude to him. The girl said that the Duke's visit was no small matter, but Wildbur apologized. The Duke himself ordered him to keep everything a secret. He had no choice. The man asked the girl to come over. She would be learning a new class today, and he asked her to guess what it was. She was wondering why he couldn't just tell her everything right away. These days they see more younger customers than they used to. This has started since she came to work, but they tend to be looking for accessories rather than gems. Since Karina is about the same age, he thought that she could develop a flair for this kind of thing and serve these clients herself, since she is quick to grasp the essence. The man said that they should try it now. He showed her two jewelry pieces and told her to choose the best one. She thought about it and asked if they were different. She thought they were similar. He points to one of the accessories and says that it is definitely better than the other. She should think about it. Who would like a piece of jewelry with a maggot on it? Karina said that she thought no one would like the doll either. Wildbur says that she has a right to think so, but in fact, it has to do with the basic theory of magic. Accessories are not just for looking good. First, she had to think about the meaning of the doll, which symbolizes transformation, evolution, and all this is connected with magic. The heroine was impressed by this. The chrysalis may look like nothing, but inside it is constantly preparing for the next stage, and when the time comes, it turns into a beautiful butterfly. Their training is hard and exhausting, and sometimes they may feel like they haven't learned anything from it. But when they go through this process and go out into the world, they will become great magicians. Wildbur said that it is dangerous to strengthen magical powers without studying the theory. This can lead to disaster when a person cannot use their own powers. It is useful for gem merchants to know the basics of magical theory, and he will teach the girl himself. She knew that if she learned the basics, she could teach her children the same. Karina thanked her husband and promised to do her best. The heroine showed Roland the jewelry, and he immediately said that he liked the one with the doll better. She knew he was born to be a magician. The boy was happy that he had chosen the right option. His mother told him that they symbolized transformation and evolution. When she finished telling the story, she asked if everything was clear. The guy was interested in listening, but Melissa almost fell asleep from boredom. Karina offered to do something else to keep her from being bored, but she just wanted to do something fun. She wanted to learn cool, powerful spells that burst and explode. Her uncle used to teach magic only to Roland, but now she wants to learn it too. The boyfriend says that she has always wanted to learn it. The other day he said he was going to teach her, but he couldn't because he was sick. Melissa, with shining eyes, said she wanted to learn a kind of magic that shines and sparkles while they pop and explode. My mother explained that this type of magic is still quite dangerous. It is difficult for masters, and she could harm herself. The heroine suggested that she learn easier magic first, but she couldn't give an example. Renka's magic was too dangerous, and she had seen the Duke's magic, nothing else. The girl was nervous. The man said it wasn't magic, even though it looked super dangerous, even too dangerous. Roland thought about it and suggested their spell for plant growth. There is nothing dangerous to help a flower grow. Karina thought about it. The boy seemed quite excited as he talked about magic. It was a great idea, although it was still boring for Melissa. The mother asked the girl if she knew why she did not allow her to use such dangerous magic. She doesn't want them to get hurt. Melissa smiled and winked at her. She was a good girl, so she would obey her. Roland brought some dandelions, and they were going to grow flowers right in the room. The boy gave everyone a flower, even his mother, and the girl was surprised that he would teach her magic as well. He said that it would be strange for him to teach her magic. He apologized, and she said that she had never studied magic before. The girl said she was fine, thanking him for thinking of her. Renka had never taught her magic, although she had always wanted to learn. When Roland taught her magic, it would feel like she was striking Renka. The guy started showing them what to do in the beginning. They had to focus on the dandelion as much as they could, and imagine what it would look like when it was fully grown. The children did well immediately. They went to their mother and told her not to worry. She thanked them for encouraging her. She shouldn't look weak in front of them, so she tried to do what the guy said. She managed to make three dandelions, which was more than she needed. Melissa began to jump and rejoice. 
Her mother had done it the first time. Roland was also proud of her. The flowers were big. Karina noticed that they looked a little strange. How can flowers grow like that in three? The children said that they looked beautiful to them. They gathered all the flowers in a vase and were looking for a new place to put them, but decided to leave them on the table, hoping that they would last a long time. The heroine could not believe that she was going to do what Renka had always discouraged her from doing, as if she had actually become free of his control. Melissa and Roland ran up to their mom. They offered to go eat with her. They were hungry. The children wanted to eat sandwiches, and Karina suggested making them with ham and cheese and salad. When they heard about the salad, they grimaced, saying they didn't like vegetables at all. Mom said that they shouldn't be picky with their food. She would make the salad, and they would wash their hands. While she was cooking, she heard a strange sound from behind. It was an explosion, and she immediately ran to the children. She was afraid that Renka had attacked them. The heroine quickly hid behind the children, who told her to look away. Karina closed her eyes. She heard a loud explosion. Maybe someone threw a bomb into the room. It is not clear who could have done it. She would ask if the children were all right, examining them one by one to make sure that nothing had happened to them. They were fine. They asked their mother to look back, and there was an apple tree. The heroine said that she was a little shocked. It happened when she decided to touch the apple. It was probably her mistake. Roland had never seen anything like this before, and he had never heard of it from Uncle Renka either. Then Melissa began to talk and perhaps it was because of the magic they had just used. The guy said the girl was right. It could be the effects of the magic they had just used. Karina was looking at her hands. Maybe she just couldn't control her own powers, so Renka kept her from using force. If you think about it, he only learned dangerous spells. Maybe he was afraid that she could hurt him because of his inability to control his own powers. Melissa turned to her mother, and she suggested that they should remove the tree themselves. They could do it right now with the help of magic. The heroine was about to touch the tree to remove it herself, but the children stopped her because she could make it grow even bigger with her touch. She asked them to do this for her, but only once, and in return, they asked her not to eat the salad for a while because the salad could grow very large. The next morning, the girl was going to work. She was remembering yesterday. Children are children, and that's for sure. They were very happy when they found out that they didn't have to eat the salad. Under the door of the jewelry store, she found a box, apparently a package for Wilder. She didn't open it until he arrived, just in case. A man opens the door and greets Mrs. Bluth, who is early today, as usual. The girl said that he had received a package from the Duke's estate. His lordship must have sent some more stones for them to appraise. Karina was allowed to open the box. It was wrapped in silk, even more strange than her dress. There were no magic crystals in the box, but a bouquet of flowers. She took their hands, and they immediately began to grow. Wilder shouted at her to drop the bouquet from her hands immediately. Karina did, and the man was shocked. He didn't understand what was happening. He asked the lady if she was cursed by a nasty man or something like that. The girl told him what happened yesterday. Her husband was shocked that she hadn't told him earlier. She apologized, thinking that it would be over in two days, and there were no plants in the store, so there shouldn't have been any problems. Sending flowers is like him. The girl wanted her husband not to move anything, she would clean everything herself, but he waved his hand. He would do everything himself. She would add even more work. The symptoms should disappear in a few days. In the meantime, she should simply stay away from the plants or take the opportunity to open a flower shop. The heroine says that if she had the opportunity, she would quit her job and open her own shop right away. The man sighed. How relieved he was that she had no money, and they both laughed. Mrs. Bluth asked him if he had any idea why this had happened to her. A long time ago, he had read about this phenomenon in a book of magic, and if what was written in the book was true, then she should not use magic for the rest of her life. This shocked her. The reason was that every time she uses magic, something like this happens. She can't control her own power. Some people are born with strong magical powers, so the other day, the magic crystals reacted only to her. Karina asks if she can't control her magic better with training. The man shakes his head. He hasn't seen any such cases at least not in the books he's read. The girl covered her face with her hands and was upset. The thought that had come to her mind last night was true. Renka did not allow her to use magic because it could put him in danger. Wildbur told her not to take it so personally that she still had a magical talent. The heroine was extremely upset. What's the point of all this if she can't use her magic? The man tried to cheer her up, but she can still use her magical powers. For example, she can feel the aura of magic crystals, but this will take years of practice. She knows how to do it instinctively. Even the Duke has recognized her talent. 
and if she improves her skills, she will become the best magical merchant not only in Taurus, but in the entire empire. To these words, Madame Bluth said that magical traders deal with magical crystals, but what would happen if she called for another eruption? Wildbur says that this happens very rarely, and if she trains well, she won't have any problem stopping it. She just needs to close her eyes and believe that the magic crystal can't take over. In addition, he says that traders can earn a lot of money. She can buy her children everything they want and still have money left over. The girl was happy to hear this and asked if it was true. The man had attracted her attention by raising her children. The shopkeeper says that if she is interested in becoming a magician, he will be able to help her. But for now, she needs to focus on jewelry. Karina sent her husband to rest because he was tired after cleaning, and she would take care of the work herself. It is an evening in the empire of Duke Torres. The butler asks the man if he is worried about something. Claude, looking out the window, replies that no, he is just thinking about his shortcomings. Lord Chichester asks what he is talking about. He could not have done anything so bad. So why is he thinking about himself? The Duke thanked him, but he still couldn't believe that his offer had been rejected so many times. He expected that he might be rejected, but he didn't think so, that the answer could be so categorical. The man decided to send her an official invitation with flowers from his garden, but even after receiving it, she completely ignored it, which is a shame. He was asked, who was this person? He named her Mrs. Bluth. She was Wildbur's assistant. Chichester was shocked that the merchant would not let her go. He was not a grateful old man. He always spoke to him so rudely, even though he was just a commoner. The duke laughed, but the butler knew that he was definitely not like that. He had to stop hating him. Claude is sure it was definitely her own choice. The man says that this is probably because she hasn't seen his face. No lady can refuse his lordship's offer. They just have to see his beauty. He was told that sometimes he does behave like a small child. For Chichester, this was not something he expected to hear, probably only because he had known him since childhood, or he was simply blinded by his love for the duke. But Claude was just joking for love, and they both laughed. I asked the man who Madame Bluth was, and he told me that she was from the north, and it was strange that she wasn't from Torres, and the butler immediately suspected that she was here to earn money and go to the capital. Herzog did not understand what this was about. It was definitely not a problem. The Lord decided to object to the Duke's choice to hire Madame Bluth. Doesn't he remember that only two months have passed since Lord Tails betrayed him and left? What he heard made Claude angry, and he had to watch what he was saying. Chichester was proving otherwise, that he had indeed betrayed him, after all those years of training a simple servant to become a knight. He had already shouted that they all just left him after training and went to the capital. The Duke could not hear it any more, and he forbade me to say such things about people who had once been loyal to him. The Lord said he was just being generous. A commoner from the North who wanted to go to the capital from the very beginning, he knew how it would end. Claude shook his head. Madame Bluth didn't look that ambitious. She was raising two children. She was not in a position to take risks. Chichester raised his tone again, saying that when people have money, they change their minds. So why does he want to get hold of it so badly? The man began to talk about her talents, her ability to perfectly recognize magic crystals among others. And he didn't say anything further, just smiled and remained in his thoughts. They asked him why he suddenly stopped talking, but he didn't take it into account. He would go to her again and try to persuade her. The Duke was confident that this time he would succeed. He had everything planned out, and her talent was very outstanding. It would be a pity to lose it. This time he has to convince her of the choice, no matter what. Torres needs someone who can tell the difference between magic crystals. When word got out that there was a man with such skills in Torres, knights wishing to receive magic swords would travel to Torres, and the man knew that he could not miss this opportunity. The guy enters Wilder's jewelry store and is greeted by Karina with a smile. The Duke takes off his hood and says that he has not seen Madame Bluth for a long time. The girl bows to him. She asks how he is doing and tells him that Mr. Wilder will be here in the afternoon. She didn't know what had brought him here, and she wanted to avoid him. Claude says that he didn't come to see his husband today, and the girl didn't immediately understand what he was talking about. The first guess was that he wanted to inspect his estate, but it was not the right guess. He says that he really came here to raise the level of Torres. He is asked how often he does this kind of research, and he says that he definitely does it more often than others. Karina said that this is why it is clear why this city is so great for simple living, all thanks to the great attention and care of his lordship. The man was smiling, thanking me for the praise and nice words. There was silence. There was nothing else to talk about. Why he wasn't leaving. Claude turns to the girl. 
He says that he wants to hear the answer to the invitation he sent recently. The same flowers. She is embarrassed. The heroine was ashamed of herself because she hadn't noticed that it was an invitation from the Duke, and she had really ignored it. The man sincerely hoped that she would be able to settle down in Torres without any problems. He highly appreciated her talent and asked her to accept his offer and serve his home. The man spoke angrily. She not only dared to refuse the offer so brazenly, she even ignored him. He could no longer look the other way. Karina began to tremble. It was hard for her to say anything. She began to address His Highness, who misunderstood. The man's gaze was cold, and he said that anyone who dared to look down on him should be punished. The girl started bowing and asking him to explain everything. That day the whole store was a mess, so she didn't even know he had sent her an invitation. She said she was sure it was true. Karina didn't know what to do now. He looked furious. In the original story the Duke is quite unrestrained. If he doesn't control his anger he will destroy the store. Claude exhaled and smiled. It was a false alarm. He had misunderstood and thought she was ignoring his proposal. The heroine said that she would not have dared to do such a thing. She was very sorry. It was strange. It seemed that he was not angry anymore. The Duke wondered why she was apologizing to him, since she was not at fault at all. The more she talked to him, the more each time it seemed that he was nothing like the person described in the original story, it seemed that he had to be a complete fool. Claude leaned over to the girl. He says he will send her another invitation, and he hopes that this time it will not be refused because he still wants her to be his. The man apologized. He had to leave now. He had another appointment for today. The Duke put on his hood and went out, and the girl told him to be careful. By all this, he most likely meant her talent for magic. People say he is addicted to finding talented people, and yet it is true if you believe the original story. She blushed and wondered why he had said it that way. She was too embarrassed. Someone knocked on the door and entered. The girl thought it was the Duke returning. But it was a courier. He came to deliver a parcel and was looking for Mr. Wilder. Since her husband was away, she took the parcel into her own hands. Perhaps nothing strange should happen. Like last year, the parcel was from the Guild. But she had never heard of them before. With the box, she went to the back of the store, where she would have to hide it somewhere. The Duke said that people with her talent were very rare, and he wanted to do everything he could to make her serve Torres. A very loud explosion was heard, and the man raised his head to understand what it was. The explosion came from a jewelry store, and the man remembered that Mrs. Bluth was alone there, so he immediately ran there.